related questions or issues that we see going on in the field. So here we are tonight with COVID related topics. Um, please note there are no contact hours awarded for this session. So my name is Marianne Drasnock and I'm the Director of Clinical Affairs here at Healthmark and I'll be your moderator for this evening. Everyone has been muted during the session, but we may ask you to answer questions or type in responses into the question tab during the program. Also, at the end of the night, we will have a drawing um, for a UV light box. So we'll see that in, um, you can see that on your screen, but we're going to give that the, away at the end of the program. Everyone again has been muted. Um, and after the program, we will ask you in the form of a survey to give us your feedback. So we would like if you would do that, please, for us, that would be greatly appreciated. Everyone will receive an email about an hour after this program um, with a link to that survey in case you missed it when it pops up at the end of the program. You can fill that out then. You'll also get a link to a copy of the recorded session. If you look on your control tab, you'll see a handouts. Um, tab. So under the handouts located in that control panel, we have provided the following for you to download. The presenter's bios for tonight, also a featured product couch brochure, and a copy of Healthmark's social media and digest flyer, which tells you what programs that we have, have done or can do in your facilities. So now let's introduce our um, clinical affairs or our specialists uh, for the night here. We have Melinda Elamari and Nestor Hernandez. Melinda, you wanna take a second and tell us a little bit about yourself, ladies first? Sure. My name is Melinda Elamari. I like long walks on the beach. Um, <laughs> prefer don't drink no just kidding um yeah so i am the educator and quality control manager um for the sterile processing department at duke raleigh hospital um i started my career in in the operating arena as a surgical technician specialized in open heart for about eight and a half years um and then worked with steris ims traveled around the country um did a lot of fun stuff taught at the Community College for five years, very involved in Amy. Um, yes, you are. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that's <laughs> Thanks, Melinda. Nestor? Hi, my name is Nestor Hernandez. I just recently moved to uh, Fort Myers, Florida to wrestle with alligators, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We have an alligator in our pond right now, a 10 footer. At least you know, throw coconuts at him. Capturing everyone's attention. Um, just recently um, accepted a position for Lee Health System as a director of operation for sterile processing, overseeing four hospitals. Um, it's um, no different challenge than any other hospitals that we work, but um, it's, it's a great opportunity, and I'm excited to be part of an amazing organization, an amazing. Um, team of employees that really uh, love what they do. Great, thank you, Nestor. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get started for the evening? So I'm gonna start with Nestor and then we're gonna go uh, back and forth. So Melinda, Melinda, once Nestor is done, I'll ask you the same question. I'd like to get both of your <laughs> takes on these COVID related questions. So Nestor, you're up first. What was or is the main difference for SPD departments or personnel during COVID-19 at its peak and versus now, or compared to pre-COVID? Like, what do you think are the main differences that you see? I, I think if, if we go back and look um, during COVID at its peak, I think what, what I personally experienced with, with my staff was, it was just a nerve wracking experience for everyone. Um, there was an increase of call-outs. Um, th th there were a lot of employees that felt a certain way having to walk by the morgue on their way to the sterile processing department and experience that. If we were to compare uh, at its peak and where we're at today, I honestly would say that we, we haven't seen too much of a change and that's just my personal experience the fear is still there and i think it's because we're still wearing the mask we we, we still you know um trying to identify or or, or understand um uh, exactly what's going on what happened so the fear is still there 
But in the positive, I think we're, we're taking extra precaution. We're understanding a little bit more our job, our responsibility. And um, we become advocacy for safety um, in what we do from the decontamination room to how we're handling the instrumentation. So have we learned something um, today? Yes, we have, but we can't deny that that fear, that uncertain feeling still exists. And we, we lost a lot of people um, during the peak of it. A lot of folks just stayed home because they feel comfortable um, receiving that stimulus check, receiving the unemployment money. And it made it so easy for them that they decided to stay home. But those that survive are still there. And they're, I, I believe they're stronger today um, than where they were when this is this all started. Great, thank you, Nestor. As a follow-up question to that, then, have you seen a difference in PPE utilization? You know, when I get around to a lot of facilities uh, pre-COVID, I thought it was pretty scary. What would I, what I would see as far as lack of PPE usage? Do you think that's improved? I think that has improved a lot. I think organizations have gotten smarter. Um, to try to uh, control the inventory uh, by bringing all of the products to just one area and manage it from one facility instead of allowing um, different uh, sites to manage their own PPE. And, and I think, you know, at one time we took for granted the PPE. Um, we had it on or we will put a mask on or we will wear the gloves and we were constantly changing for whatever reason. I think nowadays we're being more conscious in the fact that, you know, if I have to keep it on for as long as I have to, because I may not have a pair of gloves later on and so on and so on. So it, it, it really has brought some awareness of a product that we've used myself 40 years um, in the sterile processing world. And, and today we've realized that we've even taken for granted that PPE and it was so much easier to just to take it off and throw it away uh, versus trying to be more mindful of your surrounding, especially when you're working in those areas that requires the PPE. Very good, and you're so right. So Melinda, same question to you then. What do you think are the main differences between COVID at its peak for sterile processing professionals versus now? versus what you saw pre-COVID? So for me, I think one of the biggest differences and changes that we've seen is the way we approach the sterilization of items. So given, like Nestor was saying, the lack of PPE, we had to change our mindset, right? When it, for instance, when it came to N95s. So everything we were taught our whole life and our whole sterile processing career had to be like, rechanged in our mind, went out the window, and we had to start looking at how we looked at things and really understand what we were talking about. Um, so we, you know, doing the N95 process, for me, I managed that section and I still, it took me a long time to be like, I had to do a lot of research to be okay with what we were doing so that I could be sure that I'm providing a product that was safe for my teammates. So, and, you know, having to say, okay, we don't, we're not gonna put this through a decontam process like we would everything else. Um, and we're just going to take it and sterilize it was a huge mindset for staff and change and the whole fact that that was even possible. But now that we've done that, that kind of falls into like a shortcut kind of concept. You know, if I, I mean, I don't wanna use that word lightly, but, in the sense it does. And so now that that's over, it's bringing staff back to, okay, we're not in that situation. We have to go back to doing things the correct way, making sure we're following all those processes and just reeling them back in with that. Mm -hmm. You're very right. So Melinda, what do you think as far as PPE utilization is concerned? Do you see better compliance now? Do you think people are more aware of their surroundings than before? Um, I see, I can say it's like half and half. I see a lot of people who um, are still very lackadaisy of it. It's very surprising, but, um, you know, in any arena and everywhere you go, it's 
Um, but I think for the most part, like in decontam or, you know, certain areas, it's, you know, change of which mask you use, making sure you're fully protected and stuff. And so that whole concept has changed. And I think people are more um, compliant. Like we have to wear face shields and stuff in the department because we were just so close to each other. Um, and so that was a lot to get used to. So I think overall PPE compliant, I would say yes, people are more aware and they are using PPE better and they are more um, aware of the utilization of it and trying to save it. Um, I, I think now we're really, now that people are kind of seeing we have the vaccinations and stuff. And so there's a little bit of a lapse and they're starting to go you know, back. Okay, great. So Nestor, next questions for you. What do you see in the future for the SPD department post COVID-19? I mean, regarding things that will never be the same or things that will change, where do you, where do you think it's going to go in the future? I think when it comes to things that are, will never be the same, I think it's, I, I step back and go into the personal, the, the impact, the state of emotion uh, that we all went through will that change for some people it may not change for some people especially if it impacted them personally if they lost someone personally um that state of emotion not that it's never going to change but it's going to take them some time before they they can trust again right like anything else in life um when it comes to future changes things that would change i think that we all of this has brought more awareness, right? More awareness. We're going to pay a little bit more attention to the signs. We're going to pay more attention to our surroundings, pay more attention um, to things that we take for granted or we don't take serious that can affect how we do our job. Um, I took, I, I wrote a couple of things down. Um, I wrote, we may not, so like some people that take their jobs for granted, right? Um, they may not take their jobs for granted right now because look up how many people lost their jobs because of COVID, businesses that closed down, co-workers that probably, you know, passed because of the COVID, died because of the COVID. Um, and, and some people probably are waking up in the morning and being more thankful, right? And not taking their job for granted. Um, some of the things that we're seeing and changes is that COVID drove some people away from the healthcare industry. People decided, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I'm going to go to Walmart and be a greeter. <laughs> well, I'm going to do something totally different. <laughs> Is that what you did, Melinda? <laughs> right, it was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to yep, do something Yeah, or take an different. early retirement. Or, or even take an early yeah. retirement. And it all had to do with, again, what I said at the very beginning, the, the state of emotion and how all of this impacted people, all of us, and it decided to make some changes because at the end of the day, yeah, we love our patients and we want to do the best that we can do for our patients. But at the end of the day, was very, very important. It's our families too, our pets. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We don't want to go back home and, and, and get a family member sick. So uh, I think we're seeing a lot of changes. We've become smarter to understand, you know, diseases or viruses that we perhaps did not at one time and learn how it impacts the process of decontamination, prep impact. I saw employees in my previous um, uh, hospital wearing gloves. You know, I'm gonna start wearing gloves now. Did that affect the PPE? It probably did a little bit, but if it made them feel safe, then we allow them to wear the gloves. So are we gonna see more changes? I believe this is going to uh, change our industry, totally change our industry. And we as managers and directors, we got to be wise, have an open concept of open mind and, 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 and do a lot of research before we decide, yes, we could put that product in that cycle or we can clean it this way. We, we have to get smarter because, again, at the end of the day, it's about the care of our patients. 
Great, thank you, Nestor. And before we go on to Melinda, I'd like to ask the audience members, please feel free to type into the question box um, your opinions on this. What do you think the main differences are pre-COVID or COVID at its height versus now or where we'll be at post-COVID? I'll, uh, I'll take the time at the end and to read some of those. So moving on then, Melinda, same question to you. What do you see in the future for SPD departments post-COVID regarding things that you think will never be the same or things that will definitely change? And again, audience members, you can please feel free to type in your opinions too, and we'll go over those later. Go ahead, Melinda. So I think, first of all, nobody's gonna be allowed to sneeze or cough ever again out in public <laughs> without like almost getting jumped. Like, yeah, keep it in the mask, right? Keep it in the mask. Yeah. So, um, but for me, I was thinking, I was thinking about this question, and I, and I just, at some point, I believe that we're going to see policies and procedures surrounding pandemic type of situations going forward. Having gone through this, um, you know, having been in the war room, quote unquote. Um, when it first broke out and, you know, trying to decipher who does what, how this impacts sterile processing, how this impacts materials. Um, you know, as prepared as we were for a bad situation, I still think, you know, going forward, given this experience, we're going to, facilities will prepare even more. And maybe if that looks something towards like, you know, if we have pandemic that falls in category A, this is how we're going to handle it. Pandemic that falls in category B. Um, not really sure what that looks like, but I really feel like we're going to see more policies and procedures surrounding this. Um, I think another thing that's going to change is education, right? So meetings, education, look where we are now, we're doing virtual conferences, um, you know, and I don't foresee that changing. Like I, I think it, there's a lot of benefit to it. So people are really tapping into that benefit um, to reach more people and to have the autonomy to do education when they want and at the times that are convenient for them. Um, not to say that we're not going to get back to our in-person things. I hope so because <laughs> I miss, miss seeing people um, and joking around and stuff. Um, but I do think that's going to be a new norm in some type of way. Um, but, you know, the one thing that I really do wish stays and would stay is, you know, when all of this happened and all of this hit, we saw like all the little silos that are usually around our departments, right? Sterile processing, OR, EBS, all of that got broken down, right? Because we were all in it for one reason, and that was for the safety of our patients and the safety of each other. And it, and it always speaks to like when we're in hard situations, like if it's co if there's a code, nobody, you know, everybody just comes together and nobody's like thinking, oh, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to give you an EpiPen because you're not from sterile processing. Not like they would have EpiPens. But, um, you know, it's still, I think that concept was just amazing to see how everybody just came together just to help each other. And it didn't matter. We all stepped out of our comfort zones did things that we were not used to doing. And I just really wish that that would stay and continue. continue trying to continue. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, we've we've seen the same thing on the industry side with really this, this increased amount of teamwork and working together for common goals and breaking down those silos. And I really enjoy that and, and the team environment. So I do hope that that part stays also. Melinda, I also agree with you with the education. I mean, we've seen this explosion of virtual education, and I don't think that it's ever going to look the same as it used to. I don't think things will ever be fully or 100% in person anymore. I think we've we've been forced to figure out how to do it, and now we do it well, and we're um, we're accustomed to technology more than ever before. So I, I believe that going forward, we'll see a lot of the hybrid options where mm -hmm. you can, yes, you can you can attend something in person, but there'll be that virtual option there for people, which is really good for those in the facilities that don't have the support 
to be able to get the reimbursement for travel. And, and I know that's mm -hmm. always been a barrier to education. So I think that that's a good thing going forward. I mean, we've even seen it with our Amy meetings where you have the virtual options and that'll remain going forward versus just the in-person. Nestor, what do you think about the educational aspects of, of uh, post-COVID times? I, I totally agree with Melinda. I think this is the future. This is the future, and this is the direction that we are going. When we compare to what's happening to our industry and compare to what's happening to um, the school system with mm. the children, you know, um, you know, there are people that would talk very negative about that and say, "Oh, these kids, the future of our kids, um, what is it going to look like?" You know, they're not learning. But wait a minute, they, they are learning. They're learning how to log into a computer. They're learning the technical aspect of it. And this is the future. This is the future. Um, as an educator myself, um, I think this is a great tool because again, we are able, so the world is the platform, right? The world is the audience right now. When you invite people to enter into a facility and because of the uh, situation that we're all going through, you you're probably not going to get a, a large amount of people to attend because, again, of what we said at the beginning, the fear is there or the trust is there or the uncertainty of what if, what if, and, oh, he's coughing. Oh, really? You know, so on and so on. So with, with the platforms that we have, ladies and gentlemen, this is the future, and we all have to get used to this future. Right. Yeah. I think it's a positive too. have we've used it in the past. Yes, we've used it in the past, but I think we've gone like from here to here and we're growing and growing and learning a lot more. So, you mm -hmm. know, for whatever reason, all of this happened, unfortunate to those that lost a loved one, you know, something positive always comes out of this. Right. And I hate to use that term that way, um, but this this is it. This is the future. So education, let's continue to do this because we all need it. Great, thank you. Uh, we did get a couple comments into the question box. So again, for those attending, if you would like to submit a question or a comment for us to read to either or a question to Nestor or Melinda, please type that in the question box. I do need you to get used to that because we're going to do the drawing very quickly. So please familiarize yourself with where your question tab is so you can type the answer to my question in there. And the first one to respond will uh, will be the winner. So we had one comment come in and says, I think in the future, COVID vaccination will be mandated every year, just like the flu mm -hmm. shots are. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very good possibility also. Yeah, uh, we have one question that came in. I'm oh, sorry. I was just agreeing. I, I okay. said I definitely foresee that being the future. Agreed. Mm -hmm. All right, one question to, to both of you before we finish up for the night. In your experience, are you seeing more participation of frontline technicians in all the various virtual education options, more so when they were only offered in person? I'm gonna say yes, totally agree. A lot more folks, especially when it's on a later time, a lot more folks are logging in and, and doing the education online. Yes, they are. Melinda, what do you think? Um, I would agree. I think, it, that, like I said earlier, it gives people the autonomy to do it when they can. Um, mm -hmm. We all know that we have hectic, busy, crazy lives at work. Um, and so sometimes I can't, you know, you just can't get out to a webinar or a conference or, what, you know, or going to an actual in-person conference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, or the hospital just can't afford to send you. That's another huge thing. Right, you know, the right. finances, and I think that's another difference that we're going to see um, for a while is the hospitals just took such a hard hit because of the COVID situation that financially they don't have the money they used to to be able to say, okay, yeah, you go. And that is unfortunate, but that is our reality at this point. Mm -hmm. All right. Absolutely right. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of the program, and thank you both so much for uh, being our guest speakers on for the tonight. Tonight, I think it went really well, so thank you both, N Nestor and Melinda. I really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you for having us.
You're welcome. So with that, it's, it's time for us to do our drawing. So what you'll see on the screen here is the uh, some photos of the UVC light box is what we're giving away for a prize tonight. It's uh, effective to sanitize your purse. Look, Melinda has one. Where'd you get that, Melinda? I won it on the last one. I know. <laughs> Great segue. <laughs> Totally not set up either. Melinda that was, was like already. A so that was like a commercial right there. She's like, I got my <laughs> So it's great for sanitizing personal items like your phones or keys or badges, whatever it may be. So I got to pick the question for tonight. So everybody locate your question tab. Everybody who is an attendee from a healthcare facility, I see we have a couple health mark people on. So not those people. <laughs> because then I'll have to wade through them. So if you find your question, oh, thanks, Kevin said, darn. So, <laughs> so find your questions tab, locate where you type in your answer, and we'll start then with the question right now. And the first one to enter it wins, Heather said, boo. Okay, so <laughs> what is the world's largest island? Go. Don't say it, you two, don't say it. Everybody's probably Googling right now. World's <laughs> biggest island. Heather, I told you you can't answer. It's not right anyway. Oh, listen, God. Come on, somebody's got to do it. Come nope. on, Nate, Cody. I know you're Googling this. Come on. <laughs> Does anybody want some tea while we're waiting? I yes, would I would love some. Thank, Thank you. you. The Moroccan tea? Anybody? <laughs> oh, we'd love to. And we have a winner. Rudy Serrato is our winner. The answer is Greenland. Greenland, yeah. Yay. <laughs> totally not related to sterile processing. <laughs> I picked the M&M question the first time, too. So Neither was the Coke question, so. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact, said Heather. Thank you. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and finish out. We have a couple more things to talk about. The date for our April couch program is the uh, is still to be determined what the topic is. So keep an eye out for that. And we will let you know um, at a later date what the topic is going to be for April. Or if you have an idea, send it in to us and, and we'll uh, try to get to that one. I'd also like to highlight Healthmark's Virtual Exhibit Center, please go to www.healthmarkevents.com. We do have an interactive virtual product fair available on there in an exhibit hall, the interactive, interactive virtual booth, and four free educational programs that earn a 0 0.5 CEU for each of those. Of course, I'm preferential to the following the IFU one, which I did in there, uh, but there are four wonderful programs available within that events center. I'd also like to share some information for you. This is a brand new program that uh, my education team and clinical affairs at Healthmark has just started recently. And these are our vendor credentialing educational module modules. So these are really meant for other vendors and manufacturers, representatives, third party that work in healthcare facilities and have to complete these educational models modules as part of vendor credentialing systems like VendorMate or IntelliCentrics, Simplar, mm -hmm. those. So we have to do those every year in order to gain access into your healthcare facilities. Uh, so what we decided to do for our internal staff and then open it up to external manufacturers is to create these programs, get them accredited, and we have 13 modules that are available to fulfill those vendor credentialing requirements. Um, and you'll see the list at the bottom of the screen there and they're all pre-recorded by one of the Healthmark educators um, and it's only a half an hour program and they are available for $25 each so easy to access easy to go through additionally we got each of them certified for a one contact hour because there is a short quiz after that and through ISHM, CBSPD, nursing, also infection prevention and Amy ACI for the biomeds. So not only can you complete that and you get your certificate and you can upload that into your vendor credentialing system as proof that you've completed an educational program on that topic to satisfy that requirement, but you can also save a PDF copy of that 
uh, certificate and use that for your recertification. So we're excited to introduce that. They're really well done programs. You just go on to that website, put in your registration information and, and go ahead and, and go from there. So we hope that you enjoy those. And with that, thank you everybody for attending tonight and have a wonderful evening. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.